Welcome to the Musician's Toolbox. I'm Andrew. And I'm Angela. Thank you for joining us. Today on this podcast, we have a very cool interview. His first one yet, we are talking to a music producer. And on this podcast, we interview people to see what tips and tricks they have to, so that we can be successful in the music industry. Every Friday, we release a new episode, so subscribe to make sure that you do not miss one. Uh, each episode, uh, I am definitely inspired to be a better musician um, and to practice more, so we are always excited to get our inspiration. Um, so, Angela, will you introduce today's guest? Yes. Uh, today we have Mike McClellan with us, and he is a songwriter and producer based in Provo, Utah. He has a bachelor's degree in media music from Brigham Young University, and he also has a master in production from Leeds Beckett University, which is in the UK, in case you weren't, <laughs> in case you didn't know. Um, he has some personal projects that he has done recently. He had a really busy 2020. He released his EP called Blue Marble, as well as an EP called Circadian, which I believe is a soundtrack for a film that he has written the music, the soundtrack to. Uh, the film is The Cash. And um, on top of all of that, he's also produced some really fantastic artists. You may have heard of some of them, including Jay Warren, Ryan Innes, and Ashley Hess. So thank you so much for being here with us today, Mike. Yes, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. We are so stoked. Um, we like to give our listeners a little bit of background, um, if they may not have heard of you. So could you let us know a little bit about your musical journey and what has led you to where you are today? Uh, that could include maybe a memorable experience that kind of set you on this path or mentors that you've had or just a general overview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I grew up in the Pacific Northwest in uh, a Portland suburb, and I had something like 12 years of piano lessons growing oh, cool. up. Um, so that's that's the foundation. And shout out to my piano teacher, Corinne. Um, <laughs> she was awesome. And, you know, everything built on the foundation of piano for me. Um, also had great experiences in high school doing choirs. Um, um, shout out to Candy, my choir director. She mm -hmm. was awesome as well. And I did my um, my bachelor's at, at Brigham Young University in media music. And I had a lot of opportunities for mentorship with the head of the program, Ron Simpson. So shout out to Ron as well. Um, and then also in my time in Provo since, since my undergrad, um, I've played in a lot of bands. And that's been awesome. Uh, that's, you know, been huge to play with just different groups. And not all of them were trying to, you know, shoot the moon. Not all of them were trying to go places. And some of them were. And um, each one of them was a really cool experience. And uh, did my master's degree in the UK and had some great professors over there. Um, got to meet some, some really cool producers and arrangers, guys who'd worked with the Beatles and Coldplay and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so That's that was awesome. awesome. <laughs> uh huh. And uh, yeah, and also um, I've been doing a lot of uh, composing for uh, production libraries for the past eight years or so. Mm. And I've had some great, um, what's uh, not clients, not bosses, you know, the, the guys who, or, and ladies who commission projects right. um, have often been really great at uh, sort of helping me understand the business a little better and, and teaching me some tricks. So, so yeah, along the way, um, I've had lots of people helping out and, uh, yeah, I'd say it's, it's not entirely unusual. It's, it's very education based, uh, which is, which is fine. But, um, yeah. And any, any other questions about that? I'm just a little curious how you got, I mean, it kind of seems weird to go, at least most of the people I talk to don't go to the UK. I mean, <laughs> I just uh, am curious how you got that, and um, yeah. Um, well, basically, uh, I had known for a long time that I wanted to go get a master's degree at some point. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife and I were trying to start a family, and it wasn't happening. So we decided, well, maybe now's the time, and maybe let's make a really big adventure out of it. Let's go overseas somewhere. And um she had done a study abroad in, in London and she really loved it. And I'd been a longtime fan of 
British things like <laughs> Harry Potter, Harry Potter. <laughs> Sherlock, <laughs> Doctor Who. Um, so yeah, let's do the UK. It'll be fun. That's It'll cool. be an adventure. I applied to several schools over there and made it into a few. We decided on one and and then we uh, found out we were pregnant mm -hmm. and we we're like, well, if we go, we'll have the baby over there. That'll be kind of crazy. Adventure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so we did it anyway. And so um, the England experience was, you know, really a huge, a huge deal in my life because it was kind of like starting over, you know, in a foreign country where you don't know anybody um, and then having, you know, a pregnant wife and then a newborn is crazy. And trying to do a master's degree at the same time while also trying to just live it up and travel as much as possible. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the real deal, <laughs> real adventure. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they have a lot of cool. Um, the school I went to had, had great, a great music program, um, great resources and great guest speakers. So yeah, it was huge. It was wonderful. When you went as a emphasis in production, did kind of your performing take the back seat for those two years or did you still? Yeah, I didn't do any, any performing okay. in England. Um, I wondered if I would, and I did not. <laughs> mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> I'm a little curious how you, what made you choose to switch from piano to pro music production? Oh, um, I don't really consider it. Piano. Well, yeah, but you started studying right, right, piano, right? right? Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's a switch. It was, it was more of, um, you know, piano is a, a good foundation for any mm -hmm. musical career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It translates well in helping learn other instruments. Um, it's a great you know, as a performer, no matter what instrument you play, if you know piano, it's, you know, it's a good leg up. Um, so everything that I've done is sort of built on that. And, and yeah, my career has, you know, different um, hats that I put on. Sometimes I'm in producer mode, sometimes I'm in composer mode, sometimes I'm in songwriting mode or performer mode, but, but they all kind of build on the foundation of knowing an instrument, knowing music theory. Um, yeah. Well, and you should know that, Mike, when you were at BYU, you were in BYU Ambassadors, right? Which is... I Yeah, I did the Young Ambassador Band for one year. I was right. playing bass in the band, and we toured Scandinavia, and that was super fun. Yeah. You know, I don't know if I've had any experience quite like playing ABBA songs for <laughs> Swedish people. They went That's nuts. <laughs> like, it, was like, it was like we were ABBA incarnate. Wow. And, um, yeah. That's funny. So that was really fun. So he plays bass okay. and keys and he sings and mm -hmm. do you do guitar as well? Yeah, I play guitar. Yeah. Wow. So there's a lot of yeah. instruments lot under of his everything. belt. I'm sure yeah. there's more that I don't know about, but <laughs> Yeah, anyway. I play enough drums to know how drums are played mm -hmm. by better drummers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he does and a it... mean MIDI file, like <laughs> yes, you wouldn't so... move. Oh really? Yes. Yeah. Wow. MIDI programming is like learning its own instrument. So yeah. and he's yeah. fantastic at it. Wow. So cool. So, piano was like he said, literally the bass. That yeah. was, <laughs> uh -huh. and I'm sure you're great at piano too. But yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> um, I'm not. I'm not a virtuoso. Or, you that's know, what all the good people say. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> it it does what it needs to, to serve the purposes. Yeah. So I actually have a, a follow up question because you talked about um, the libraries that you write for, and is it right to assume oh. that that is in the sync world? Is that, or is it? Yes. So. Uh, lots of people haven't even heard of that. Yeah. So can yeah. you explain to us what that so even is? So anybody who doesn't know what library? sync refers to, um, sync is short for synchronization, and it's just the process of um, taking a piece of pre-existing music and dropping it into other media, visual media, um, but also, you know, also like radio commercials and stuff like that. So um, there's kind of two ways to do it. If you want music in your in your film or your commercial, you can have it composed for that purpose, or you can drop it in from a library. So, you know, uh, stock photos would be a good um, analog to this, but there's, yeah, there's tons of production music libraries out there and they have a, a wide range of quality and price. Um, but as a composer, it's a really good gig because um, yeah, when you when your stuff gets used and hopefully used a lot, it's a nice source of uh, passive income. 
And how did you get involved in it? Like, did someone tell you? Did someone hear something you wrote or you just knew about it or? Yeah, uh, my cousin Steve Newman and I were roommates in college and we were very inspired by Jack Conti and Pomplamoose and they would, you know, earlier days of YouTube, mm. it was kind of a fresh thing to mm -hmm. film yourself playing different instruments and arranging a song and sort of watching that in real time. Um, so we did a few videos like that, of songs we liked, covers and songs we oh. wrote. And and um, a f our mutual cousin shared one of those videos. And then a professional working in a music library uh, contacted us and said, hey, I saw this video. Obviously, you guys can do this thing that I need somebody to do. <laughs> so would you like to work on this project? And that wow. was sort of the door in. Cool. That's incredible. And you're obviously very good at Pro Tools and production, so that doesn't hurt either, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. well, I think that might have helped that you could see us like working with the computer and, and sure. you mm -hmm. know, using microphones and stuff. And it's like, oh, these guys can record themselves. That's what right. we need. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I, from what I understand of the sync world, it's also really important that if they want a certain part of a song or if they want, you know, the vocals taken out or that kind of thing, being able to do that quickly can also determine whether they do or don't use your music. Is that right? Um, yeah, a good a good library track, if it has vocals, should stand alone well without them um, and should have moments of interest throughout um, while also having uh, moments that can be looped sort of indefinitely it's good to kind of think like um, what would a video editor want to have at their disposable disposal in a piece of music mm. and then try to go from there and give them that. So is most of your music for production or for these libraries, is it commissioned or is it, do you write it and then just put it in there? Uh, a little of both. It's mostly commissioned. Okay. Um, but there are libraries that will just take submissions um, it will, and you know, and there are libraries that if you're kind of on their team, they'll say, "Hey, we need something like this. Do you have anything like this?" Mm -hmm. So it's good to have a little library of your own stuff mm -hmm. built up that you can pitch to things. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of my stuff is done on commission as well. And do you still write music with your? With, it was your cousin you said, right? Well, my cousin Steve. Yes. Um, yeah. So Steve and I ran a studio together for several years, um, and then when I went to England, um, we obviously had to start working on our own. And when I came back, I came back with a baby and, and, and he and his wife had a baby at the same mm. time. Um, so we've kind of been working more in parallel since then. And he's, um, his career has taken him a little more towards um, acting and storytelling, oh, interesting. which is super cool. Um, but he's still a great composer and, and musician too. So I think as time goes by, we'll work on more stuff together and, you know, we're, we're awesome. buds. We're good yeah, buds. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay, so we mentioned that you've recently written a soundtrack for a short film, which hasn't been released yet. Is that right? So I should clarify. Um, there, there's two different projects. Um, oh, okay. So the soundtrack to Circadian, uh, Circadian is a short film that uh, that my wife is actually an actor in, and mm. that was shot in 2019 um, and has been on the festival circuit in 2020 and will be released to the public early next year. Awesome. So um, as part of the soundtrack to that movie, I wrote this song that my friend Kelsey Edwards uh, performs on. And I figured it would be cool to just release that and have that out there because it, it's a good song. She was really excited about it. Um, so that's out there for people to listen to. And and also, if you like listening to movie soundtracks, it's it's got you know actual like composed music from the film on that record as well. Um, but that's different from The Cash, which is a short film that my wife and I uh, developed together and shot in November and is in post-production right now um, that I will also eventually do music for, but it's a question of finding the time. So. Sure. Yeah. Got it. Cool. So I, two films. That's awesome. Um, with the film that you and your wife are doing, is the intention for that to go on the festival circuit as well yeah um it's meant to be a portfolio piece for her as an okay. actor and for me as a composer slash screenwriter 
um, we'll yeah we plan on submitting it to to film festivals but you know regardless of what comes of that um, it will just be a cool thing to have made hopefully. that's awesome yeah. good for you I think it's so cool that you get to do that with your wife too like yeah a really yeah, awesome really project mm -hmm. so cool um, so when you get an artist to call you and they come into the studio what does that look like as the producer of an artist what do, what do you do um, so my favorite definition of a producer is somebody who's responsible for taking a project from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And in terms of music, uh, that means that when the project is initiated, it might be at any, you know, of various stages. Uh, and my job is just to help get it totally finished and ready to release. So sometimes the song will be written and I'll just work on the arrangement and the recording. Sometimes there will just be an idea or, or just a desire to make a song and I'll help <laughs> with the writing as well, which okay. is fun. Um, sometimes I'll record everything myself. Sometimes I'll hire musicians uh, if I want like live drums or some strings or a better guitarist. Um, you know, I'll reach out to people that I know who are really good at that stuff. Uh, sometimes you know, we'll record the vocals with equipment that I have or that the artist has. And sometimes we'll throw down to go to a big studio. Um, so it can look like a lot of different things. Uh, but I'd, I'd say the thing that I most do myself in the in the production process is arranging. I'm usually coming up with the the parts that different instruments are going to play, fitting the song into a, a, an instrumental structure and making sure all those parts get recorded. And did you learn that skill working in a studio as an apprentice or taking composition courses or how, how did you get to that? So the first, um, so the first experience that, that I had with this sort of thing, um, when I was a kid, my older brothers had this Yamaha sequencing keyboard that could play all these, you know, different nice. MIDI patches. Um, you know, MIDI strings, MIDI horns, MIDI drums, and your standard, standard like synth sounds. I'm sure the sounds were fantastic. Yeah. It. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's funny because back then it was like, yeah, we were having fun and messing around, but my brothers are, are so ashamed of the stuff they made, <laughs> even though I thought it was amazing. You know, I was their biggest fan. Uh -huh. But it's funny to go back and listen to those sounds and to hear how they've become vogue again. Right. Like the lo-fi 80s aesthetic mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. back in roaring form. So, so yeah, it was a cool keyboard. I wish we hadn't gotten rid of it. I, I wish I say, still had it. You keep those things and they're worth <laughs> way more than what you paid for them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so they would make these little songs and MIDI sequencing, for those who don't know, is, um, is the act of arranging MIDI information to, to play different tracks at the same time. Um, so they would make little songs out of these these MIDI patches. And, and I loved that. And when I was old enough to be allowed to touch their stuff, they let me do it too. Mm -hmm. And then um, my dad, a few years later, got a, a, a Tascam four-track tape recorder, okay. which um, wow. which does overdubbing. You record one thing onto one track, and then you, you can play that back and record onto a separate track over the top of it. And that's the basis of how like most recordings are made. Um, so, so yeah, that, that was kind of my, my early, early experience with that was that at home, my dad and my brothers had this interest in music that led to sequencing and overdubbing mm -hmm. and arranging. So, so yeah, so going to college and, and studying it and then just, you know, doing it in a professional setting was just really trying to be better and better and better at that. So for someone who's thinks they might want to do something like music production or I mean there's lots of different subcategories in the uh, music media field or whatever but what would you recommend would you I mean there's a bunch of courses online there's college there's just figure it out or what yeah, would you uh... yeah so um my experience with with formal education is that um the school is going to in theory, set you up with your gear, um, teach you how to use your gear, teach you the principles behind, you know, getting a quality broadcast quality recording, um, you know, and then 
hooking you up with people to collaborate with and practice with and then just giving you assignments so that you just create a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and then also a good institution will also hopefully hook you up with some masterclass opportunities to, to see people working in the industry, ask them questions, see how they do it. So that's kind of what a, a formal education in music production entails. And that's all stuff that you can do on your own with you know, some money to, to buy your gear, um, maybe attend some workshops. But you know, a lot of it you can do yourself because YouTube is this mm -hmm. crazy wild west chaos of information that you can <laughs> sift through if you have the time. And um, I recommend that if you don't have the means or the time to do a formal you know, degree, um, do some, some product research to get some good gear to start out with. And then maybe call somebody like me, and this is a plug for me, um, <laughs> or somebody like me, uh, to get like a lesson or two. And hey, can you, you know, I'll pay you 50 bucks. Can you use me to, uh, can you teach me to use this gear? And oftentimes one or two lessons is enough to kind of get you started mm -hmm. so that you can just practice. And at that point, it's just create, 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 keep learning. You know, if you have the curiosity for it, um, you, there's just a lot of resources out there. There's masterclass, there's all this stuff on YouTube, there's Skillshare. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think we live in a, a, a day and time where there's never been a better time to try to be a creative person because the resources are all so accessible. Mm -hmm. That leads me to my next question because I think that um, for a creative person who's not a techie person, the gear is super overwhelming and mm -hmm. yes, there's so many like reviews and whatever but it's kind of like buying a car unless you know what model you want it's really hard to choose all the things you put inside of it because there's so many vehicles to choose from so if i wanted to get started with a home recording studio would you have any recommendations for like a starting out kit if i have a really low budget yeah um i do so I, in your email, you asked me to kind of prepare a, a medium budget and a low mm -hmm. budget option. Um, so the first thing that I wouldn't skimp on is having a good computer. Mm -hmm. um, if you're an, a Mac person, having a really good iMac or a really good Mac Pro or a really good MacBook with processing power to handle audio, that's essential. Can't get and around that. And how much processing power <laughs> is essential? Because I am someone who bought a MacBook that was actually... To, like I, I talked to a salesperson and I was like, this is what I want to do on it. And they didn't give me enough memory on it. So what oh. would you, yeah, literally <laughs> like I was, oh. <laughs> I had to wait years to buy another computer and it wasn't what I needed. So Dude. what would you say is a minimum of uh, Ram. Ram for something like this and a minimum for, and I know you can always save on like a backup device, but just to have on your computer so it doesn't get overwhelmed because recording software takes up a lot of space it absolutely does so <laughs> um i would have uh bare minimum 16 gigs of ram mm -hmm. and then um in terms of like storage you know just yeah i would i would have a, a big enough hard drive that you can store a lot of software on it but it's it's often good to store your actual audio recordings on a separate drive and your um your audio samples as well if you're using sampling instruments. Um, so get yourself a, a couple terabytes of, of storage as well, and you should be good to go. Okay, perfect. I just okay. had to do it yes. because it's yeah. a mistake that I've made, and it was so frustrating. <laughs> yes. Like sales rep at Sweetwater, and I'm like, you do good work. Why would you tell me to get oh, this man. computer? No. Uh. Yeah, that's, that's too bad. That's too bad. Anyway. Um, okay, so let's say you're going for... Um, not like a crazy pro, super expensive Pro Tools Ultimate setup, but something something nicer than the bare minimum. Um, you can get Pro Tools, and then you need uh, an interface. So an audio interface is basically the middleman between your computer and anything you want to input into your recording software, like a microphone or a MIDI controller or a synthesizer or guitars, uh, like electric guitar inputs, that sort of stuff. Uh, so you need a good interface. And then uh, you've got your, uh, probably a microphone is, is necessary. So if you're getting Pro Tools plus a nice microphone, a nice interface, and a MIDI controller, um, that 
probably runs you somewhere in the ballpark. You know, this is obviously there's lots of options out there in the ballpark of about 2,500 bucks. Mm -hmm. If you buy Apple logic, which is much more uh, cost friendly mm -hmm. and um, a more uh, consumer level interface, consumer level microphone and a MIDI controller, you can do that for about 700 bucks. Okay. So yeah, that's, well, that's kind of, there's a big range in there, but absolutely um, ballpark figures. And a question, a follow-up question to that. Why do I need an interface when there are USB microphones? Uh, good question. If you have a USB microphone, you can plug it directly into your computer and record directly to your software. So you might not need an interface. Um, and if you have a MIDI controller that's USB, uh, you can play MIDI notes right into your mm -hmm. computer as well. So yes, there are situations where you might not need it. If you have any sort of situation where you want to record with multiple microphones at a time, um, or if you have a microphone that's a, a little nicer and doesn't just plug in via USB, you're going to need some sort of way to get your audio signal into your computer, and that's where the interface comes in. And is it right for me to say that USB microphones are not going to be as high of quality as one that you put through an interface? To be honest, I don't have a ton of experience with USB microphones. Okay. Um, I understand they're great for podcasting, um, but like I, I don't think I've seen them much in recording studios. Um, what I see a lot in recording studios are really nice condenser microphones and dynamic microphones and ribbon microphones that are plugged into a you know yeah. an which you won't find for a USB mic. No, so. don't believe so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I have a question about software because i think a lot of people don't know which one to choose and then you said that logic is more consumer friendly but i also know that like jacob collier who is a very successful musician uses logic so can will you just kind of maybe lay out what what to look for that would be right for you for a yeah so uh so these these programs are called daws or daws a digital audio workstation and there's lots of them there's pro tools there's logic there's ableton live there's uh reaper and garage band and cubase audacity um, audacity yeah there's lots of them and they all basically do the same thing um but they're all also slightly different so for a long time, Logic was known for having really great MIDI capability, being very user-friendly with how you input MIDI, but not handling audio as well as Pro Tools. Pro Tools kind of had the corner in the market of being the good audio software, but not being as good in its MIDI capability. And then Ableton um, was originally made as a performance tool where you can play loops over each other and kind of uh, do loop sequencing, but as all these programs have been around for longer, the companies try to compete and um, increase functionality so that there's uh, so that they can be as good as their competitors at different things. So, you know, they're all good. <laughs> you can do a lot with and all they all of do them. the same thing. <laughs> you know, you can you can make an entire record with GarageBand, and GarageBand mm -hmm. comes with a Mac. Um, if I were starting over, I'd be very tempted to start with Logic because mm -hmm. it is more cost friendly mm -hmm. and it is a great great piece of software and it comes with lots of good um, stock plugins uh, plugins being uh, pieces of software that you apply to different audio tracks to change you know add effects and things like that uh, logic has a really great library of stock plugins um, and also virtual instruments um, pro tools has its own stuff but yeah i think logic is really good bang for the buck ableton is also really great so my this this is my understanding because again i'm not great at this as you are but ableton is kind of something that users use more when they do not have a mac is that right um like it's a more window or pc type program? i honestly don't know i i'm struggling to remember the last time I, I was in a studio that didn't have a Mac or worked with somebody that was working on a PC. Yeah. So, this is so. what I've, yeah, this is what I've found when I speak to people that are in production. If they, if they don't have a Mac and they want, like, the industry standard, 
they usually go with Ableton Live. And then my understanding of Pro Tools is the reason that it is used so much is because it actually was the first DAW on the market before Logic, before Ableton. And so it kind of got its spot in the market before anyone else could. And then Logic and Ableton kind of answered Logic for Mac and Ableton for PC. I don't know if that's true, but that's kind of yeah, what it seems I, I'm, like. I'm not an expert on the history of it, so that's that's really interesting. Um, what I what I do know is that when I started out, I started out on a PC with Pro Tools, and it worked fine. Right. Um, yeah. And then I switched to Mac at some point. Well, and I think Pro Tools has always been compatible with both, and that's been yeah. the mm-hmm. the benefit of it. And I also don't think that means that Logic doesn't work on a PC. It's just it was written by Mac people, so yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Before we move on, there's yeah. one thing I want to step back. And you said that talking about education and how to get um, started in music production. Um, I know for traditional musicians, uh, a good way to know what you said is a good institution um, is a lot of like pianist people that are studying instruments. They go and have lessons with the people at the colleges. But if someone wants to go to a good institution for music production, do you just like email the teacher and say, hey, can I have a lesson? Or is that different? How, how does that look like? Um, yeah, I mean, it's possible I'm not the best person to ask about that uh, uh-huh. because <laughs> the last institution I went to was overseas and I never <laughs> set foot there before yeah. I enrolled. <laughs> yeah. um, so that was a little, you know, <laughs> a little, probably a little more flying blind than you want to do. Yeah. Um, but I recommend getting in touch with the, the professors there and and doing a, a campus visit and, and seeing okay. if they're, you know, if you like the the vibe, if you are impressed by their their resources and their okay. studios and all that. Mm-hmm. It sounds like it's not as big of a deal uh-huh. for production. Yeah. Because, I mean, I could be wrong, but like, you know, with violin, it's like, oh, here's the most famous violinist or they have the best studio all their students are getting the jobs right now whereas production there's such a big need for it that you have programs but it looks like you're thinking about it now so you could (laughs) you could correct me i mean if i if i had my druthers right i would um i would sign up for a a class with uh jason evigan or um you know ryan tedder these these big producers who are doing it, you know, Phineas, you know, I don't, I don't know of them, you know, having a lot of, um, doing a lot of masterclass type stuff, except for right. Ryan Tedder right now has, um, a workshop going through monthly that okay. you could check out. Um, so that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the, the, they're not again, necessarily I, things that are offered through <laughs> university, yeah. right? You have to. Yeah, I mean, hopefully. Person. I mean, if you go to like to UCLA or something or USC, um, Berkeley maybe, mm-hmm. you're gonna see some really big names coming through and and giving some master classes. So okay, okay. get to that's, them. Yeah, so the, there is some some research to do there. Um, mm-hmm. You know, where I went to to do my master's program, we had guest speakers like Ken Scott, who was a Beatles producer and worked with mm-hmm. David Bowie. Um, whereas if you go to someplace in LA, you're gonna be rubbing shoulders with people who are working with, uh, you know, more current pop stars, probably. So okay. the L.A. film yeah. industry. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Um, so because you're a producer, you would I feel like you have a better understanding of this because you hire musicians on occasion. Um, what is your take on online recording and being able to have? Is there a marketplace for that? Um, is there a need for it or is it? more often it needs to be in person so so this year uh since the pandemic started i've done all of my work entirely remotely Mm -hmm. and what that's looked like for me is a lot of um working with uh you know musicians who are set up at their home to record themselves so i've got a you know a couple of drummers that i you know like to work with a couple string players and um and backup singers so so i've you know contacted them and say hey here's the here's the session or here's an audio track to work with can you record this on top of it send me a few takes that sort of thing and that's been that's been really helpful so i don't know if that's exactly what you're talking about when you talk about online recording but um 
but that's my experience with it. Did you find all of these people because you'd worked with them before or did you go to a platform? Yeah. Um, so over the past uh, nine, 10 years I've been doing this, um, you know, I've, I've met a lot of people and, and I guess that's one thing that's cool about the, the 2020 need to do things remotely is that, you know, one of my favorite drummers lives in New York now and I get to mm. just, you know, I might as well call him as call, you know, equally talented drummers that are closer to home because it's all the same in terms of <laughs> um, doing it remotely. Sure. With the pandemic, have you had a lag in your work or has it continued to be the same or have you had more? Um, it's a good question. I, uh, it's hard to say because mm. being self-employed, there's such a big mm. fluctuation <laughs> normally anyway. So it's hard to say, you know, what this year would have been like without the pandemic. Um, but one thing that has been more frequent this year is that I will I'll be waiting on somebody to record something and then they get sick. <laughs> oh. They get, they test positive for COVID no and we have way. to wait um, for them to get better or, or, you know, in a, in a couple situations, somebody has, has set up a studio where they want to go in and book time, but then the studio closes because somebody mm. tests positive for COVID. So, yeah. so there's been a lag there. That's crazy. Which is no bueno. No. <laughs> no. Come on, vaccines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, right? It's going to be a couple more months yeah. now. But. Mm -hmm. um, so we're kind of going to pivot a little bit away from the production. And this is kind of a little bit more of a personal question. But have you ever st struggled with, these are things that I feel like a lot of musicians struggle with, doubt, depression, anxiety, um, comparing yourself to others. And if you have, could you speak to how you've dealt with that and um, how you've been able to overcome that? Absolutely. Uh, yes. Very, very, very mm -hmm. close to home. Absolutely deal with uh, feelings of, gosh, am I even, you know, is this even worth it? Am I any good at this? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, wow, it's, it's, you know, should I have been a, a dentist or an accountant? That sort of thing. Um, 401k. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's only natural. Um, especially because art is so subjective mm -hmm. and at the end of the day especially if you're you know if you're a songwriter trying to get your songs cut by famous singers there's going to be a lot of rejection or if you're submitting to music libraries there's there's rejection involved in that too so yeah it's it's emotionally quite hard um for me there was a big attitude shift kind of a night and day life-changing thing hmm. when i discovered a book called the war of art by Stephen Pressfield. That book is short. It can be read in an afternoon. And I've read it several times and it was just made a huge difference because the whole point of the war of art is um, that there is this force that is inside all of us that the author calls resistance that tries to stop us every day from creating art mm -hmm. because creating art is socially a bad idea. It, it's vulnerable, it's risky. It, um, on a fundamental biological level, it increases your chances of getting kicked out of the tribe. So you got to go face saber tooth tigers mm -hmm. by yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, so overcoming this force, uh, of resistance is what the whole book is about. And his thesis is basically adopt the attitude of, of a pro. And what, what he calls a pro is just the attitude of this is my job whether you make money at it or not, your art is your job. You show up at work at the same time every day. You approach it with an attitude of detached professionalism. Um, you don't get too attached mm. to the things you make. You say, I am here to do the work. doesn't matter if it's good. doesn't <laughs> matter if I'm famous. doesn't matter if, uh, you know, this or that. All these, these doubts and things that resistance tries to throw at us, the focusing on the work and the attitude of, the, of being a professional is the cure. And according to him, um, Adopting this attitude and these practices inspires your genius to overcome resistance and to bring from your higher self these ideas, these flashes of inspiration um, in such a way that, it, you know, you break through the resistance, you overcome writer's block, your doubts and fears, and you're able to actually create stuff. And then you don't feel too proud of yourself because you just keep working, keep trudging through the mud. This is war. So that's kind of the the um the thesis of the book and after i read it for the first time it was 
it was really helpful to kind of separate myself from, well, if my music's bad, then I'm a bad musician, so I should stop. You know, that's no, no, you just focus on the work, try to overcome resistance, let your creativity do its thing, and then just keep going. And that was a, a really helpful attitude shift. And I'd say I've been less depressed and more prolific since then. So I, it's my number one recommendation to anybody involved in making art is to read that book. How long ago did you find it? Uh, I found it, you know, this is one of those questions where the answer has been lost in the haze of having a baby <laughs> and the sleep deprivation. There's this foggy <laughs> barrier in my memory that things kind of get lost in. So it was several years ago. Okay. Um, <laughs> what is the book called again? The War, the of, War Art. of Art by Stephen Pressfield. And I'm not oh. getting paid to pitch this book, by the way. Just a fan. <laughs> but so, if you would, if if uh, the, <laughs> the publisher is listening, we are gladly taking sponsorships. <laughs> I, I would accept. I would accept if that was offered. Yeah. I will be your poster child. <laughs> anyway, um, I've found that oftentimes when... Um, for someone that may not be established in their career that thinks it's so cool that you've worked with, mm -hmm. you know, the artists that you have, um, we kind of look at that as being like such a cool accomplishment, which it is. I don't mean to uh, make that less than what it is, but even having done these fantastic things that you've done in your life, what would you consider to be your greatest accomplishment um, with all of that in mind? Yeah, uh, you know, on paper, my greatest accomplishments are probably that I once played at the um, the Stadium of Fire show in Provo, oh, Utah, cool. which is a, a Fourth of July <laughs> celebration at uh, the the BYU Stadium, where they often have a local group have a chance to perform, and there's a competition involved in everything. Um, so I got to play in front of a stadium of people one time. That was pretty cool. And then uh, the other, probably on paper, biggest accomplishment would be uh, that an album I worked on this year went to number one on the iTunes R&B chart. Oh, so, nice. Congrats. so that's cool. But um, but uh, I'd say like I don't tend to think in terms of, you know, trying to check off boxes of accomplishments. Mm -hmm. I, I think what I'm more what I more feel in terms of how I evaluate my career is I'm I'm grateful for the different experiences I've had. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for um, the, the chance to just do this. And the fact that I haven't thrown in the towel yet is mm -hmm. is huge. Um, mm -hmm because it's been tempting many times and and I've been at it long enough that I think it's I, it's impressive to myself. I'm I'm grateful that I'm still still going. And uh I'm grateful to work with the artists that I do because you know it's it's really magical to be uh, in a writing session or a recording session with a singer who can you know really just bring this amazing talent and emotion into a song. Hmm. There's nothing quite like it. And so the fact that I get to do it and I haven't done it much this year because, you know, mm -hmm. it's been remote. Um, but I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful for all the the collaborators and and um, and my family who are so supportive. Uh, yeah, I, I'm grateful to just have the chance to, to do this work and, and be a musician. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. And finally, what are some tools you'd recommend musicians to put in their toolbox? Uh, great question. Two things that I would recommend. Uh, first, and this is probably less applicable to, to your listeners, if I understand, um, because it's more of a, a thing with uh, working with you know artists and aspiring producers. Um, learn your music theory. Mm -hmm. it, it can only help, and a lot of people feel insecure without it, because you can be a, a famous musician. You can be a Grammy-winning artist, and know basically nothing about music theory um but i don't recommend that mm -hmm. uh learning your theory is empowering and it opens doors it helps you to communicate it helps you to take control of your writing and your performing and then the second thing would be i think everybody should have a way to record themselves mm -hmm. uh, and get a clean nice recording so if you're a piano player you know having a good virtual piano software and a good MIDI controller with weighted keys, I, I think that's important. If you're a, a violinist, I think you should have a good microphone for recording your violin and some recording software and know how to get a good, clean sound. Um, it's empowering. It's helpful. It allows you to demonstrate to other people what you can do. It allows you to record ideas and compose. 
which is always a good idea. Um, so yeah, so I'd say my advice is learn your music theory and get yourself set up to record. Cool. Thank you so much. If people want to be able to find you, what are what are your uh, like how can we find your website or instagram or so uh, my i'm on instagram um my instagram handle is <laughs> <laughs> not memorized <laughs> it's mike mcclellan music all one word the mike mcclellan music and um my website is is going to be changing soon so mm. but for the time being you can find it at velvet echo studios.com forward slash Mike dash McClellan. Got it. Cool. Or you can just Google my name and spend some time sifting through the different hits of the, <laughs> the, Australian the, the more famous <laughs> the Mike more. McClellan, who actually, you know, has a, a career as an artist in Australia. <laughs> he's good. He's good. But you'll have to, you'll have to skip through him a little bit to find him. Sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank it's you so much pleasure. for making time for this. Yeah. Go thanks on. for having me. What a great interview. Thank you so much for listening and watching. And we truly hope that you have found some tools to put in your toolbox. Our podcast, as a reminder, can be found on various platforms as well as on YouTube. Once again, feel free to send us a DM or voice message with anything that you'd like to see in the future. Um, We often post announcements and upcoming guests on our social media. So if that's interesting to you, you should go and give us a follow. Yeah, we would love some follows. And lastly, while we do love doing this for free, podcasting is not free. So if you really like what we're doing and have uh, gained some value from our show, there are a few ways that you can support us. You could share with your friends. You could rate and review. And subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You could also shop our merch, uh, which you might have seen in our YouTube videos, or become a supporter through a donation at the Anchor Podcast link in the show notes below. Thanks for watching. See you later.